so uh, everyone welcome uh, to the IEOR virtual seminar series. Uh, today it's our great pleasure to have uh, Lu Yiyang uh, virtually visiting us from virtually across the campus. Uh, Lu Yi is an assistant professor in the uh, operations and information technology management group at uh, our university, at the Haas uh, School of Business. And uh, Lu Yi's research, among his uh, wide research interests in service operations, digital marketplace, sharing economy, sustainable operations. Uh, Lu Yi has a particularly strong uh, interest and insights in the theories for understanding emerging, emerging new business practices. And uh, uh, prior to uh, joining uh, Berkeley, uh, Lu Yi has also been an assistant professor a faculty at John Hopkins Carey School of Business. And uh, uh, Lu Yi received his PhD from uh, uh, an MBA from the University of Chicago, Booth School of uh, Business. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Lu Yi to give us uh, uh, the seminar talk, Lu Yi. All right, uh, thanks so much, Zoe, for the very nice introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to see everyone virtually here over Zoom. Um, so today I'll be presenting my joint work with uh, Chen Jin from National University of Singapore and Karthi Kosanagar from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Now, uh, the motivation of this work uh, really comes from the, this notion of brushing, which is an increasingly common practice on many e-commerce platforms. So let's just cut to the chase of what is brushing. Now, brushing refers to this practice whereby online merchants place fake orders of their own products uh, so as to inflate their sales volume and move up in search results. And here is how brushing works. The vendor finds brushers and pays them the cost of the products uh, they will order plus a fee. The brushers place orders for the vendor's products. The, vendors, uh, the vendor delivers parcels that are usually empty or contain some random stuff. The brushers then pay with the money they got in advance. And finally, the vendor's products rank higher in search results generating more future traffic. So uh, as a practice, brushing is witnessed on many major e-commerce platforms around the world. And as a phenomenon, it has also received a widespread press coverage from many major media outlets. Now, most recently, if you've been following the news, those unsolicited packages of mysterious seats have really brought the issue of brushing back to the fore, and if anything, uh, to a whole new level. Um, in fact, uh, it has been so contentious that I recently got approached by the South China Morning Post, who asked me to comment on this practice. So uh, to give you, just to give you a bit of an idea about how pervasive brushing is, Alibaba had found that 1.2 million sellers on its main Taobao shopping site, or roughly 17% of all merchants, have faked 500 million transactions worth 10 billion yuan in the year of 2013 alone. And many believe this is only the tip of the iceberg and just a very conservative estimate. Now, at this, quite, at this point, a natural question uh, pops up. So why do sellers brush? I'd like to share with you at this point uh, several quotes from the, Washington, um, Street, from, from the Wall Street Journal, uh, which hopefully will give us a bit of a hint as to what is going on under the hood. Now, uh, the first quote came from a Tabo merchant who said, how do you get yourself noticed by customers in the sea of products if you don't even have a single cell? And this is very much echoed by the second quote uh, from another tab on merchant who said, without fake transactions, your product will end up at the very back of the search results and people will never be able to find it. Uh, this is very much, uh, so last but not least, here's a quote from an industry observer. The difference between being at the top of a page of results and buried at the bottom is night and day. Now, brushing is a very tempting shortcut. So what these quotes uh, really reveal are really two driving forces at work. The first one is search frictions, and the second one is ranking algorithms. Now, consumers typically face search frictions in these e-commerce platforms, and they often only consider those prominent products that are ranked high up in search results um, so if your product is bared somewhere in the middle of page eight, chances are consumers probably won't even bother to flip to page eight to click on your product, let alone purchasing it. Uh, so this is really the first driving force uh, behind brushing. 
The second one really has to do with the ranking algorithm. Now, platforms ranking algorithms favors products with higher sales volume. The idea over there is that if a product sells well in the past, it might as well do so in the future. So as a platform, I might as well just push the product high up in the search results. And this evolution of sales volume and product rankings really forms a positive feedback loop um, as shown here on the right. Now with a higher ranking comes more sales because of the presence of search frictions on the part of consumers. On the other hand, with more sales also comes a higher ranking because of the ranking algorithm widely adopted by many e-commerce platforms. Okay. So these uh, two forces are really at the core of brushing. Uh, but brushing goes above and beyond that. So here are sort of some other potential reasons why sellers uh, might consider brushing. Um, so for, intent, for all intents and purposes, I will say at least there are three major factors. So the first one is something we've already talked about. Um, sellers, really try, or sellers are really trying to manipulate rankings to really gain visibility in such a system. Uh, where rankings matter and sales volume influence ranking. Okay, so that's the, the first motivation. And the second reason as to why sellers might consider brushing is because they may want to simply pad and inflate their sales figures so as to signal high quality. Okay, and number three is that alongside fake orders, they often also inject fake reviews. So what they do typically uh, for, for those sellers, those sellers, what those sellers typically do is to insert the glowing fake reviews alongside those fake orders so as to bias consumer perception. So as to convince somehow that consumers, their product, the products that they sell are of high quality. Okay? So in, for the purpose of this paper, our focus is really gonna be on the very first motivation factor uh, because if you think about it, I would say this is probably the number one first order effect uh, because really the second and third factors have to do with influencing how consumers evaluate a product, whereas the first factor really has to do with whether consumers even consider a product in the first place. Okay? So to the extent that consumers have to first consider a product before they evaluate one, um, we're going to focus on the first order effect of, uh, of the first effect. So that's, uh, that defines the scope of the research. So what are I trying to do over here? So what are the research questions? Now, first and foremost, how do sellers strategically brush? How do sellers strategically behave in this competitive environment? And more importantly, what is the implications for consumer welfare? Um, so here, we're gonna really take a consumer-centric view and explore three sets of questions. The first one is to really look at the impact of ranking algorithms. Now, what is the rationale of sales-based ranking and what are the potential unintended consequences? And second, what about the impact of brushing cost? Um, so in practice, if you read those press articles, platforms often claim that they have no tolerance whatsoever for brushing. They do not condone brushing, they condemn brushing, and they often use, at least according to their claims, they often use sophisticated machine learning and data analytics tools to combat such a practice. So given platforms proclaimed commitment to combating brushing, and to the extent that brushing is very hard to eliminate, will consumers necessarily benefit if brushing is actually made more difficult and more costly on, on, on the part of sellers? Um, and last but not least, uh, given that we're also going to look into the impact of search cost. So given that consumers' search frictions are at least partially responsible for the occurrence of brushing, Will a lower search cost necessarily dampen brushing incentives and improve consumer welfare? So in order to address these research questions, we're gonna build a stylus analytical model, which will be composed of three parts. So the first part has to do with consumer search. The second part has to do with sales and ranking evolution. And the third part will be a brushing game among online sellers. So the reason why we're going to set up a game in a game theoretic model is because this is a competitive environment, right? So my brushing strategy naturally also depends on what other sellers are doing. And that's why game theoretic models will be appropriate um, in, an, in analyzing such a setting. All right, so before we jump into the model, at this point, I would, like to, I would just like to pause for a while just to see if there's any questions 
um, about the scope of a research, about the general context of Russian. Um, so any questions, comments at this point before we move on? Are there accounting implications of brushing? I know this wasn't the research, but mm -hmm. what, what are the accounting implications of a, of a company that does brushing? Uh, so I think, yeah, so that's a very good question. So brushing has become so pervasive in some of these online platforms that, for example, when Alibaba went public back in the end of 2014, it was explicitly, the Russian behavior was explicitly mentioned in their perspectives, perspectives when they went public. So the idea is that with a lot of these fake orders, their GMVs that they report to their potential investors will also be inflated, which will actually reflect well to a certain extent on those platforms because they were saying, oh, we're doing a fantastic job by attracting so many orders, right? But to what extent these orders are authentic and real, uh, is, is a different question, right? So I think there's also kind of accounting implications or, or financial implications from an investment, attracting investment uh, standpoint. Um, this is also something that's, uh, that's problematic, right? And for potential investors, when you're evaluating the performance of those major, you know, gigantic e-commerce platforms, you should also take those statistics with a grain of salt because those GMVs may be inflated by fake orders. Okay, thanks. Russian. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Thanks so much. Any other questions at this point um, before we move on into the model? All right, um, so far so good. So let's just uh, jump right into the model. Uh, as I said earlier, it's going to be a stylus model. Um, so we're really trying to build a model uh, that captures the essence of the situation, right? Um, without getting too much worried, without getting too worried about the, the, the nitty gritty details of reality, okay? So this is what it looks like. We're gonna consider two competing sellers on an e-commerce platform selling substitutable, su substitutable products. So seller H sells product H and seller L sells product L. Uh, over two, representative periods, and there's going to be one consumer who arrives in each period. Now, here's what the consumer valuation of, uh, of, of each product looks like. So for product I, consumer's valuation is VI plus epsilon with probability gamma, and their valuation is VI minus epsilon with probability one minus gamma. So um, with probability gamma, the product, we can say that the product is a good fit. So that's why their valuation is higher. And with probably one minus gamma, we can say the product is not a good fit. So as a consequence, their valuation is lower. Okay, so there are two components to consumer valuation at this point, right? So there's the V component and there is the epsilon component. Now the V component is what we refer to as the prior value. So this is the information that they already have, either based on prior research or based on their past experience with the product. Um, and the epsilon value is something that consumers don't know ex ante. So this is really their match value, value that they're uncertain about, and they're trying to resolve their uncertainty through costly sequential search. So here's the dynamics, how it works. Now, when, consumer, when each consumer arrives, uh, he or she, she is presented with an order list of the two products. So she see a particular ranking, and she conducts costly sequential search to resolve uncertainty about the match value. So she knows the prior value VI uh, part. She doesn't know epsilon, but she can, she can search for that information. So here uh, we normalize the search cost for the top product to zero. Okay? Uh, but we say that the search cost for the bottom product is C. Okay? So if you think about this, it really captures in a very stylized way, uh, also a very succinct way, the ranking effect. Okay? And this assumption is also this model setup is also empirically supported by recent empirical literature uh, in consumer search, which basically shows that the reason why the ranking effects uh, exist is because rankings impact consumer search uh, through the search cost. So the idea is that as you move down the list in the ranking, the search cost associated with that particular product also gets higher and higher. And as a consequence, there's this natural tendency 
to, to focus on those products that are more prominent, that are high up in search, in search results. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, consumers will decide where to search uh, and to when to stop, right? So this is a, uh, once we have all the constructs, this is essentially the classical consumer search problem. So essentially consumers are solving a dynamic program, right? So they have to decide their selection rule in terms of where to search, uh, which product to click on first, um, and also their stopping rule um, in terms of uh, when to stop search and purchase the current product they've already evaluated from, of which they already know uh, the potential valuation. Um, their goal is to maximize expected utility. Okay. So once again, the idea is that once you search a product, you have to incur a search cost depending on the ranking of the product. And after you incur the cost, you'll be able to realize You'll, you will be able to see the realized match value of that product, right? Because you, you've done your homework. Okay? And at the end of the day, uh, consumers purchases, uh, each consumer purchases one product after search. All right. So at this point, uh, we've talked about how consumers search uh, for a given ranking. But of course, an interesting question is how are those rankings gener generated in the first place? Um, so as the sales volume evolves, so does the ranking. We're going to consider two ranking um, systems. Hi, hi Louis. Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. So I have a question uh, about your former slide uh, mm -hmm. as to the as to the ranking effect. So we know that uh, many times in the same web page, usually we can see many different products. So what if these two products are shown in the same web page, then you don't have to go to the next page. So that may not evolve uh, extra search cost. Um, so for example, in that empirical paper referred to was a 2018 paper in marketing science uh, published by, uh, authored by Ursu, uh, currently at NYU. So she basically looked into this Expedia setting where you have, where, where you search for hotels and once you Queried in once you queried in your uh, search criteria, there's going to be a bunch of hotels that show up um, in a single page. Okay, so from that single page, what uh, consumers observe is essentially, you know, corresponding to our model, uh, the prior value. So you see the prior value, but still there's some lingering uncertainty you may have about the underlying hotel or the underlying product, and that's where the uh, search kicks in. So search cost here, you know, captures the cost of flipping pages. But even if you're in the same page, um, search costs can also search also involve scrolling down and navigating through the pages. So, so that's why there's definitely uh, an advantage to those products that are ranked higher. And here I capture this advantage by assuming that the search cost for the lower ranked product is higher, uh, which is also empirically supported by that marketing science paper. So essentially. They say there are sort of seven or eight different ways through which rankings can impact search. And it turns out empirically, uh, this is the only thing that's possible according to their uh, empirical analysis. Yes, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions at this point about consumer search before we move on? Why would I know the VI before I conduct, so like, why would, I, why would I know the VI on the lower ranked product um, prior, if, if the notion is that this is uh, seen by costly search and that I now identify this uh, product. There's a notion that I know that all these products exist, um, or just help me think about uh, why the search cost only helps, or is only relevant to the uh, idiosyncratic fit. Yeah, so the VIs is, uh, are considered as uh, the prior value, right? So either you have some prior knowledge about the product, so you already kind of form your assessment uh, based on the prior, uh, your prior research, or you can say once you see the list page, right, that gives you some summary statistics or summary information about each product. So you may have a rough idea about those products and from which you form your prior value. But there's also some details you want to figure out and so that's why search kicks in. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Any other questions at this point? 
All right, so now let's move on to ranking systems. So the first ranking system we consider uh, is a very simple one, uh, very intuitive. So it's simply random ranking. Um, uh, so it says that the rankings are generated according to a fair lottery at the start of each period, irrespective of what happens in the past, right? So this is independent of sales volume in the past. I simply flip a fair coin every, in every single period, at the start of every single period. So of course, this is a kind of a very naive ranking algorithm or a ranking system, if you will. But at the core, it really captures the setting where sales volume does not matter, where sales do not really influence ranking. So naturally, in such a system, I don't really have, a, have a, I don't, as I as a seller, do not really have a whole lot of incentive to, to brush to inject fake orders because those fake orders won't really be counted toward my rankings in the future. All right, and this really contracts the more interesting case, the sales-based ranking system. In such a system, products are ranked in descending order of their cumulative sales volume in the past, okay? and rankings are updated with every single new sale. So this essentially captures the feedback loop uh, that I just talked about a couple of slides ago. Uh, with a higher ranking comes more sales, and with more sales uh, comes a higher ranking. Okay, so so that's uh, that's essentially uh, what we're trying to do over here. Naturally, in the sales-based ranking system, there will be an incentive for 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 sellers to brush to inject fake orders because that will impact their rankings in the future. All right, so one thing I'd like to point out is that neither ranking system requires any explicit knowledge about either product attributes or customer preferences. So they could hold some practical appeal because of the relative ease of implementation. Okay. And which may justify why they, they're so commonly practiced, especially with sales-based ranking. Okay. So with that in mind, we're gonna move on to our brushing game, right, between these two sellers. Now, um, we assume, uh, we say that each seller incurs cost CB for brushing one unit and earns a unit reward from selling one unit. So the idea here is that fake orders are costly and real orders are rewarding. Now brushing occurs at the beginning of the sales horizon um, for now in a base model, just to get the idea across. So here uh, is the sequence of events. Um, so at the beginning of the horizon, brushing occurs. And based on the fake orders, uh, rankings are updated. And then seeing the updated ranking, a new consumer walks in uh, and decides on where to search and which product to purchase. And based on that new, newly generated sales, uh, sale, the rankings of the two products are updated again before the second consumer shows up. Okay. All right, so in terms of the brushing strategy, um, we say that the brushing strategy of uh, seller H is QH between zero and one, and the brushing strategy of uh, seller L is QL uh, between zero and one. So QH and QL essentially capture uh, the probability of brushing one unit. And each seller maximizes, each seller determines their own brushing strategy to maximize their own total expected profit over the two periods. Okay? And the solution concept we're gonna look into is the Nash equilibrium, okay? So at this point, a couple of remarks are in order. Um, as you can see, this is a kind of a very stylist model, right? There are a lot of assumptions that we make uh, just to make the model tractable, simple and elegant, right? So there are many ways to relax this, uh, this, uh, this model, right? One thing we can say is that why not just restrict attention to brushing at the beginning of the horizon? why not allow sellers to dynamically brush over time, right? As they see sales volume realized over time, they might as well adjust their brushing strategy and, and, in, and insert some additional fake orders as they wish, okay? So uh, we do not consider that in the base model just to get clean results. Uh, we do consider an extension of dynamic brushing um, in, the, in, uh, in the paper. So, so that's, that will be taken care of. And the other potential um, criticism, if you will, is why only two periods, right? Why not assume more periods, okay? So we also consider another, another, another extension where uh, we have multiple periods, and in fact, an infinite number of periods uh, down the road, okay? 
which will actually offer us uh, a very nice angle in terms of the comparison between the long run effect of brushion and the short run effect of brushing. So here with two periods in the model, it kind of captures the short run effect of brushing, but we can certainly think about what happens in the long run. And we do think about that. We do consider that in an extension. Okay. So, uh, so that's that. And the other assumption that you may find restrictive is assuming brushing strategies between zero and one. So essentially, um, so if it is strictly between zero and one, we're talking about a mixed strategy equilibrium, right? Uh, in which sellers uh, randomize between faking zero orders and faking one order. Okay. Uh, of course, we can generalize the strategy space by allowing for uh, faking multiple orders more than just one unit. Okay. So that's, that's doable. It's just going to be very messy. Uh, and we do consider that also in, in an extension. All right, so as you can see, we're just want to, all we're trying to do here is to really strip the model to its bare core so that we can understand what are the driving forces over here uh, so that we can have a clearer insight. Okay. Uh, but we do consider various extensions down the road. All right, so any questions at this point about the model setup before we move on to our results? Questions, comments? Confusions, objections. All right, so I just assume I did a fantastic job. Uh, I'll keep going. All right, so here's our results. Now, first and foremost, uh, what is the brush and equilibrium? In order to understand what the brushing equal looks like, we first need to figure out what is uh, the purchasing probabilities based on consumer search. So these probabilities are endogenous, right? So they're, they're an outcome of how consumers search. Uh, we are specifically going to consider, obviously, um, two scenarios. Um, as we can see over here, in scenario one, product H is ranked at the top. And in, in scenario uh, two, Product L is ranked at the top of a product H. We define P1 as the probability of purchasing H in scenario one, and P2 as the probability of purchasing product H um, in scenario two. All right, so what are the P1s and P2s based on consumer search? Now, it turns out that these purchasing probabilities are a function of uh, consumer search cost, as expected. When the consumer search cost is uh, really low, what we see here is that P1 is equal to P2, uh, which essentially suggests that there's no ranking effect, right? So regardless of how these two products are ranked relative to each other, we're gonna always have the same purchasing probabilities, okay? Because you know, consumers are, uh, are not really subject to the, to the ranking effect. They can search as they wish, right? At very low cost. So they're gonna figure out which product they're gonna purchase, right? So rankings don't really matter that much in terms of purchasing probabilities. And this really contrasts the other end of the spectrum where the search cost is really high. In this case, P1 is equal to one and P2 is equal to zero. So what this really says is that there's essentially no ranking effect, right? So what consumers do in such a setting when search cost is really high is that they simply purchase whichever products ranked at the top without essentially conducting any search. Of course, these are two extreme cases. Uh, what's more interesting is what happens in the middle, right? So when search cost is intermediate, then we're gonna have both the ranking effect and the product effect, right? And specifically when the search cost is intermediately low, when we're in the second bucket, the product effect is always gonna dominate uh, the ranking effect in the sense that P2 uh, will be greater than a half. So yes, if, product H is buried at the bottom, we're less, we're not as likely uh, to purchase product H uh, as if it is uh, ranked at the top, but still we're more likely to purchase product H and product L. And this contrasts uh, the, the, the third bucket, when the, the third bucket, when the search cost is intermediately high, in which case the ranking effect may sometimes uh, dominate uh, the, the product effect in the sense that the P2 
can sometimes be greater than a half and sometimes less than a half, depending on uh, the fit probability gamma. Okay. All right, so these are the three intuitive properties that we can really glean from this uh, purchasing probabilities uh, exercise. So the first property that we property that we see is that P1 should be weakly greater than P2, which says that for a given product, consumers are more likely to purchase it if it's at the top, uh, which essentially captures the ranking effect. And property two uh, essentially captures the product effect. It says that P1 plus P2 should be greater than or equal to one. Uh, so if we were to translate that into plain English, it says essentially that says that for a given ranking, consumers are more likely to purchase a product if the product is product H. Okay. And property three is a simple corollary of the first two properties. It says that if product H is ranked above product L, then consumers are more likely to purchase uh, product H. Okay. So why do I want to highlight these three properties? Of course, the search model is very stylized. So you, you can definitely create your own search model, uh, but most likely these three properties should hold, right? Because they're so intuitive. And as long as these three properties hold, uh, most of the insights will carry through uh, because that's essentially what we're relying on. Okay? So the purpose of the very stylized search model is to just give us a crystal clear idea of how consumer search impacts purchasing probabilities, which in turn uh, per impact the ranking algorithm, the ranking dynamics, I should say. All right, so knowing these purchasing probabilities, we will be able to characterize the brush in equilibrium. Okay, so it is uh, shown over here in this diagram. So here the horizontal axis, the X axis is the search cost C and the vertical axis is the brush and cost CV. So as we can see, if the search cost is really low, then essentially there's not gonna be any brushing whatsoever, right? Um, it makes uh, intuitive sense. Uh, if you think about it, if search cost is really low, then consumers are not really uh, subject to any ranking effect. So consumers uh, are immune from that. And as a consequence, they can always figure out which product is their favorite product. So you know, fake orders have no, uh, no role to play over here. Now this really contrasts what happens when the search cost is really high, okay, uh, in the fourth bucket, in which case, um, essentially what we see here is that there's either going to be a no brush in equilibrium uh, or a full brush in equilibrium. So what do we mean by a full brush in equilibrium? It simply means that both sellers uh, brush uh, one unit. Okay, so it's going to be a pure strategy equilibrium. So the bottom line here is that uh, the underlying equilibrium is going to be symmetric between these two sellers, either no brushing or both sellers brush the full quantity at the same quantity. Okay? And why is that the case? In this, in this scenario, um, as we saw in our, in our earlier slide, the search cost is really high, so the product effect uh, doesn't really matter over here. Right? So, so the two products are essentially symmetric from the perspective of consumers, because they can't really search at all. They cannot really afford to search at all. Okay? Of course, once again, what's more interesting is what happens in the middle, right? When the search cost is, is intermediate, specifically, we see that uh, the brushing cost also plays a critical role over here. When the brushing cost is really high, as expected, there's gonna, not going to be any, any brushing. Okay? So we're going to end up no brushing equilibrium. When the brushing cost is is relatively low, we're going to see a full brush in equilibrium. So both sellers are in full swing because brushing is just so cheap. Uh, what's most interesting, arguably, is what happens when the brushing cost is also intermediate in addition to an intermediate search cost. In this case, we're going to have a partial brush in equilibrium. So the two sellers both will mix between uh, brushing zero units and brushing one unit. Um, but their purchase, but their brushing probabilities and their brushing strategies may differ. Okay, so just to dive into how these two sellers differ in this partial, in such a partial brushing equilibrium, uh, let's take a look at this diagram. Okay, so this is what happens when the search cost is intermediate. So we're going to have an interesting case of a partial brushing equilibrium. So here, the horizontal axis is the brushing cost CV, and the vertical axis is the pro the, the probability. A brushing for the two sellers. So here the black 
um, solid curve corresponds to the Brushen strategy of setter H, and the blue dashed curve corresponds to the Brushen strategy of setter L. Now, what we see here is that due to setter H's quality advantage, the cell space ranking system is in fact biased in favor of setter H in the sense that it is more likely to push setter H to the top at the start of the second period. Okay? So in this sense, setter H has, really has an advantage, has a defensive incentive uh, to really defend its advantage, whereas the setter, setter L has a disadvantage and as a consequence as an offensive incentive. And, and setter L sees Brushen as the only opportunity to challenge the setter H's entrenched position. Okay? So how does the Brushen cost uh, comes into play? So if we look at the Brushen strategy of setter H, we see that it's a downward sloping curve, right? As a function of the Brushen cost, which is intuitive, right? As Brushen becomes more and more costly, setter H brushes less, which actually contrasts what happens to setter L, right? So in the, when the Brushen cost is intermediate, as we increase the Brushen cost, the Brushen, prob the Brushen intensity of setter L actually increases. So this is, I would say, a little bit counterintuitive. If, well, so what it's saying is that if Brushen cost increases, we're actually gonna see more Brushen from setter L um, in this case. Okay. So essentially what is going on is really, is really this uh, quality advantage of setter H uh, relative to setter L. Now, when the Brushen cost is high, uh, of course, Neither setter wants to brush, but you know, setter H, this, uh, setter H decides brushing is not worth it, and it chooses to really rest on its laurels, which in turn gives setter L a strong incentive to brush. Right? So if setter H doesn't brush, as a, as a, as a setter L I actually want to brush a lot. Okay? So that's why as, as soon as the brushing cost drops below a certain threshold, we're going to see full brushing of setter L, L and no brushing of setter H, okay? Um, on the other hand, if setter H brushes a lot due to a low brushing cost, then setter L will say, there's no way for me to challenge setter H's entrenched position, so, so I might as well just back off and do not brush a, a whole lot, okay? So in sum, what this really shows is that the quality in this advantage of setter L really compels it to go the other way. It really has to act in a more strategic fashion uh, by marching ahead with brushing when doing so is very expensive, uh, but backing off on brushing when doing so is very cheap. Okay. And this structure of the brushing equilibrium has implications for consumer welfare. Okay. So how do we define consumer welfare? It is simply so the average I'm consumer sorry, utility I have per a year. question mm -hmm. for the yes. former slide. So uh, for the low type, why are there two jumps in, in the graph? But for the high type, there is no, not any jump. That's an excellent question. So over here, there's going to be a, there's going to be multiple equilibria for okay. this particular brush and cost. So for in, in all of these equilibria, the brush and strategy of setter H is zero. But for setter L, it could be anywhere between zero and one. Okay, so oh. all of these are equal over there, right? Which again shows the strategic behavior of setter L due to its quality disadvantage. Oh, I see. So for the first to jump, it's the same reason, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so all of these are equal over there. Oh. And, and one more question from a slide before this. Um, so, for the second interval and the third interval, there are both three different cases. Uh, so are there any significant differences between uh, the insights of the second interval and the third interval? Uh, so that's a great question. So the insights are the same in this base model where we have two periods. Okay. Qualitatively, they're the same. The, it, the insights will be different once we have a, an infinite horizon model. We have where we have an infinite number of periods. Okay. Um, so that's why I want to differentiate these two um, types of search costs. But for now, they're the same qualitatively. Well, 
All th these results are realized uh, due to different uh, brushing costs, even for the base model, right? Be because you see, uh, no, I, I mean, although th they are both three different cases, but uh, the second interval um, is, is due to like the, the bargaining cost is from maybe 0 0.3 to, mm -hmm. but for the third one is from maybe 0 0.7 to a greater value. So, so the, the parameters is different, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that's why I'm saying qualitatively, the insights are the same, but quantitatively, of course, the, the numbers oh, are different, I see, I see. right? Mm -hmm. The numbers are different. Mm -hmm. Right. So as, as we can see, one, as we move to the left, there's a greater and greater incentive to engage in no brushing. Right. So the no brushing region expands, whereas the brushing region shrinks because mm -hmm. now the search cost gets lower. Consumers will be able to find out what's going on. So I might as well not brush as a seller. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Great. All right, so for the interest of time, I do have to move on uh, into consumer welfare. Another uh, benchmark results says that the sales based ranking system improves consumer welfare. Okay? And um, so in the random ranking system, obviously there's not going to be any brushing. Okay, uh, there, because there's no incentives for sellers to do so. But, but in the sales-based ranking system, uh, there is an incentive to brush, okay? And that will have implications for consumer welfare, as we can see uh, over here. Now, here, again, the horizontal axis is the brush and cost CB. The vertical axis, on the other hand, is consumer uh, welfare. So here, the, 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 red, the red dot dash line is, corresponds to consumer welfare in the random ranking, and the solid black line corresponds to consumer welfare in the sales-based ranking system, assuming a, way, assuming a way brushing. And the blue dash line corresponds to consumer welfare in, with brushing, in the sales-based ranking system with brushing. So first up, what we see here is that without brushing, yes, the sales-based ranking system achieves higher consumer welfare than the random ranking system, which justifies why possibly the, the sales-based ranking system is so commonplace, okay? However, once brushing kicks in, things are a little bit different, right? So what we see here is that um, sometimes consumer welfare can be so low when brushing kicks in that it's gonna be even lower than what it would be under random ranking, okay? And what's the, what's the driver for that? It is really because the two sellers brush uh, differentially, right? So when the brushing cost is intermediately uh, high, if you recall from a couple of slides ago, seller H brushes a lot, sorry, sorry seller L brushes a lot, whereas seller H brushes relatively very little. And as a consequence, uh, consumers are worse off, okay? So the key insight uh, here is that uh, brushing may have subtle implications when it comes to the comparison of consumer welfare across two different systems and consumer welfare can be even lower than what it would be under random ranking okay and also increasing the brushing cost doesn't really help doesn't necessarily help consumers right so as we see in this figure increasing brushing cost may only encourage uh, may may only discourage uh, high quality sellers from brushing which in turn motivates seller L to brush even more. And as a consequence, consumer welfare may also suffer, okay? So the manageable implication for the platform here is that it should really caution against the potential unintended consequences of a tougher regulation against brushing, right? So if brushing is made more difficult and costly for sellers, um, it's not necessarily gonna benefit consumers because it's gonna affect different sellers uh, differently. All right, so now let's talk about the impact of consumer search cost. So conventional wisdom would say that a lower search cost should benefit consumers because A, it allows consumers to incur less of a cost and B, it encourages more search. 
So indeed, what we see here is that this is true under random ranking. So uh, the random ranking corresponds to the last uh, the, the red line. Uh, over there, we can see across the board, it is a decreasing in search cost, which means that as search cost uh, decreases, consumer welfare is going to be uh, is going to increase under random ranking. Okay, so this is intuitive. Uh, what may not be so intuitive is what happens in the cell space ranking system with and without regression. Okay, so what we see here in general is that in either system, there's going to be a non-monotone effect. Okay, so reducing search costs can reduce consumer welfare in the cell space ranking system uh, without brushing or with brushing. So without brushing, essentially what happens is, uh, what kicks in is search externalities. So early consumers may impose search externalities on later consumers, while facilitating more search by early consumers always benefits early consumers themselves, it may nevertheless hurt the interests of later consumers by pushing the wrong product to the top if consumers do not always agree on what they like. Okay? So luckily what we find is that this is more of a, just a short run effect. In the long term, it will be such a market distortion will be corrected if we allow for, uh, if, if we allow the cells evolution to evolve for a large enough number of periods. Okay? So what is lingering though, what may persist in the long run is the distortion that occurs once brushing kicks in. So reducing search costs can in fact disincentivize brushing across the board, but it will almost certainly disproportionately affect um, different setters. And to the extent that it disproportionately affect high quality setters, it may ultimately harm the interest of consumers. Okay, so to recap here are insights. Um, consumer search cost, reducing consumer search costs may actually reduce consumer welfare uh, somewhat surprisingly with or without brushing. Um, the effect of without brushing is, is short-lived, but the effect of with brushing can sometimes be long-lasting. So the implication here for the platform is that improved search technology is not necessarily a panacea uh, that's going to cure all the problems. Platforms also need to consider the interaction among consumers and more importantly, the strategic response of setters to the change of search cost. So of course, as I mentioned earlier, we consider a lot of extensions uh, in, in this paper. So um, I would argue probably the extensions on the left are the more interesting ones. Uh, in my view, uh, the extensions on the right are not as interesting. Uh, uh, we still did that uh, for the obvious reason. So uh, uh, I'm gonna skip all the details of the extension, but just quickly summarize what we're doing over here. So we study a growing practice on e-commerce platforms known as brushing. There are two key drivers that we identified for brushing. One is search frictions on the part of uh, um, consumers, and the other is the cells-based ranking algorithm widely adopted by platforms. Now, a cells-based ranking system in principle should achieve higher consumer welfare than random ranking when setters are not strategic. However, uh, the cells-based ranking system is also susceptible to manipulation, and sometimes due to such manipulation, due to such brushing behavior, consumer welfare can be even lower than what it would be under random ranking. So in terms of manageable implications, uh, we essentially tell three cautionary tales. Sales-based ranking system doesn't always work relative to random ranking. The effort to combat brushing uh, may sometimes backfire and introduce some unintended consequence, uh, potentially hurting consumers. And last but not least, uh, making search easier, presum presumably by improving search technologies, sometimes may also reduce consumer welfare in this context. All right, so what I would like to highlight is that brushing really goes above and beyond e-commerce platforms, even though the focus of our paper and this talk is on e-commerce. We actually see brushing of best-selling books, uh, blockbuster movies, app downloads, um, podcasts, uh, charts, and sometimes, last but not least, also in pop music. So, so what is really going on here? Why is Russian so um, pervasive and why is Russian so rampant? Now, of course, this is a very much an open-ended question. Uh, feel free to share your answers and your opinions. But the way I think about it is the following. So the crux of the problem is that we really live in this uh, era that is increasingly data-driven and increasingly data-dependent. 
we're obsessed with data. We measure performance by data, we test algorithms against data, and we learn from data. However, our very reliance on data creates a distortion in data itself. On that note, I'd like to conclude my talk. Uh, thanks so much for your greatest attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions in the remaining uh, time, um, if you will. Thank you so much. I think I missed a point that you were making on, on why not combat brushing. Um, could you maybe speak to that another second? Can you hear me? Sorry. Like I can hear you, but it seems to me that Louis may be experiencing a little bit of yeah, I think we're losing him. Maybe we lost him. Okay, he Louis back. Uh, Louis, uh, can you can you unmute yourself? Oh yes, sorry. I think I somehow was disconnected. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I, I had a question on your. I think it was next to the last slide on um, missed your point on kind of why um, companies shouldn't focus on com on on combating uh, brushing. Why why is that a negative thing? Uh, so. I guess we have to be a little bit careful here. So what I'm trying to say is that it may trigger some unintended consequences if we do not do it carefully. So if you just drive away brushing across the board uh, by making brushing more difficult, right? For example, by increasing the penalty of brushing, right? If you actually detect brushing or increasing the right. logistical cost of creating a shipping, a fake shipping label, right? So that's gonna increase the cost of brushing for sellers presumably across the board. But what may happen is that it may drive away the brushing behavior of high quality sellers first, which in turn gives those low quality sellers a stronger motivation to brush. And if that's the case, then we're gonna see those mm. low quality products moving up to the top, which will actually hurt the benefit of, uh, hurt the interest of consumers. So I would think that that would be a short term. So that's the, that's uh, the message I'm trying to come across, get across. Okay. I would think that that would be a short-term concern, but over time, I would think that still the, if you are fighting brushing, then the, the better sellers wouldn't need to brush in order to be ranked higher. And, you know, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, be subject to the penalty. No? Well, I mean, it depends on how much search friction we have. So if there's only a little bit of search friction uh, mm -hmm. in the system, Yes, it's going to be a short-term effect because in the long term, the, the ranking will stabilize and whoever is better will actually you know, claim the top rankings. Sure. Sure. But if the search frictions are very high, then consumers are basically shooting in the dark, right? So they're right. very much uh, at the mercy of the ranking effect. Okay. If that's the case, then that gives the low quality setters a lot of incentive to brush, especially right. if the high quality setters back off. Back off. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's the message I'm trying to get. Okay. Yeah. Very nice question. Appreciate it. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll add, uh, you, you uh, gave several examples of kind of where else you see brushing. Uh, I, you know, a couple of the places that uh, I've seen myself are uh, the news feeds that you have on your cell phones and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Once you go in and look at certain articles, then it tends to serve up the same type articles and it basically creates this feedback loop. So to the exclusion of things you may be interested in, but, but because you never clicked enough previously, it doesn't serve mm -hmm. it off. I guess a little bit like Netflix and the Netflix mm -hmm. uh, rankings. Mm -hmm. Negative cost. Yeah, so at a certain point it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It does, yeah. it does. It's, it's right. a negative feedback. Uh, but sometimes they may also branch out. Yep. Yeah, so, but sometimes they may also explore a little bit, right? Experiment with different stuff and you know, they will recommend some stuff that you don't normally see or do, right? So just to get a taste of your response, yeah. you, know, may, you yep. may like it, you may not like it. 
Um, so, so I think it's a trade-off between exploration and, and exploitation. Yep. Right? So I, I have a quick question. Um, can can you hear me? Not sure. My mic is working. Yes. Um, Go ahead. So, uh, this seems to be the a, a response to trying to uh, the the wisdom of the crowd, right? There's this. Um, effort, I look at brushing as an effort to manipulate the wisdom of the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Are there mm -hmm. other strategies exactly. than just pure crowd wisdom these days for, for mer merchants and, and platforms to leverage to give consumers a, a better indicator of what they want to buy? Because when I look at, you know, Amazon and I look at the, the rankings, a lot of it is just to see if other people have use the product and it's, it, you know, that there's a certain level of quality based on the fact that other, you know, there's other people who have had scar tissue before me. So I'm not buying something, I'm not the mm -hmm. guinea pig, right? So, you know, are there other strategies mm -hmm. that, that platforms are trying to implement that, that would just obviate the need for, you know, brushing? Well, I think to a certain extent, um, platforms are always trying to extract consumer data, trying to learn what is going on, right? We're trying to extract consumer preferences. And if that's what you're doing, right, regardless of how sophisticated your algorithms will be, um, it's essentially based on this uh, crowdsourcing idea that you just talked about, right? So we can think about, you know, sales rankings, we can think about uh, rec recommendation systems, we can think about consumer reviews, uh, essentially, this is everything is built based built off of consumer behavior and what they observe about what consumers do in the past or other consumers do in the past. So, in that sense, you know, brushing can be a very tempting shortcut, if you will, uh, to manipulate such uh, crowdsourcing based um, platform strategies, right? But because in yeah. practice, platforms often host gazillions of products. Right. Right, but so, so we're, we're, it's very hard for them to investigate every single product. So they have to rely on a more systematic approach to figure out which is which and which one is better. So you think that as a category that we're looking at, you know, these crowd based rankings as this, as like the, as the baseline system that we're going to be using on these platforms, or is there a new category of, of method for, um, you know, giving consumers some kind of indication of, of what to buy? Is it, or is it just going to be purely, mm -hmm. you know, ranking based on the number of uh, purchases that we're going to use as a kind of a, um, an artful way of saying, okay, that's something that I think is quality. Or is there something mm -hmm. else coming along, you see? Well, I, yeah, I think in practice, obviously, the, the ranking algorithms and the recommendation algorithms are going to be a lot more sophisticated than the one I presented in my stylus model. Uh, but the, I think the underlying spirit uh, is somewhat similar, right? So, so you cannot really abandon all your consumer data to really investigate every single product by yourself, right? If you can do that, right, then you basically can do away with this crowd-based strategy. But I, I suspect in practice, it's gonna be very hard to do. Sometimes they just frame things differently. They will say, we somehow figure out this is a high quality product, this is a low quality product, right? But the, the way they figure that out is usually based on a crowdsourcing strategy. Uh, so that's why I think it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a persistent issue uh, right. in, these, uh, in these online settings. I'm, I'm curious what the That's the way I think about it. I wonder what kind of effect this will have. Um, I just realized recently, I've, I've been buying a lot of Amazon branded things to avoid this brushing. Like I didn't realize there was, a, you know, this whole mm -hmm. thing was going on, but I could tell that there was some manipulation going on, but I could trust the Amazon brand because I know if it's not good, I can send it back, right? And, and have no issues. So I wonder if there's this weird adverse effect where it will drive towards more um, behaviors, you know, consumers moving towards the monopoly play versus buying these things from these merchants because of this, of this behavior. Mm -hmm. I guess this raises the question of, uh, of this trust issue, right? Do you trust sort of the a decentralized mechanism uh, where, which relies on kind of the wisdom of crowd or do you trust more a centralized 
recognized authority like Amazon, right? If this is endorsed by Amazon, then presumably that's more trustworthy, right? So this is a, I think this is more of a debatable issue depending on who you are as a, as a, as a buyer. Um, but that, that, that's definitely a very interesting angle, right? Um, so I don't know, I don't have a clear answer, but I'd really appreciate the, uh, the question. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, th thank you. Thank you so much, Louis, for this excellent uh, talk. It's, it's really a great pleasure uh, to, to, to be in this seminar. Yeah. Mm -hmm.